I think the best ideas always come from folks who have like the least amount of resources. I hated that I coughed right during that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Cough away. Becca's trying to have a really profound moment, but you just got to me just hacking away. <laughs> oh, God. Do we have anything like this that we can, like, capture smells? smell o vision is, like, really coming down the pipes. Um, I've been in contact <laughs> with a lot of folks about this. I'm super excited to be reviewing these products soon. I would love to ask you about AI now. Are you ready? No. No, I'm not ready. <laughs> so much of like big creators, yeah, maybe they are giving out a million dollars, but like everything they're doing is being done with a big team and it's super fabricated. I think we're all a little bit trepidatious. Is that a word? Yeah. That has a good That's ring a to it. Word. Yeah. Trepidatious. Let's talk about the Webby that you won earlier this year. Oh my God. Wait, you want to see it? Oh my gosh. Oh, absolutely. Ah! Welcome back to Inside the Creator Studio, an origin story podcast about the world's best video content creators. On today's episode, we have Becca Farsacci, who is an award-winning video producer at The Verge, which is a tech news publication operated by Vox Media, and their YouTube channel has over 3 million subscribers. She hosts a series for them called Full Frame, which is all about cameras, and we're going to talk to her about her college experience, the early days of Vox, the Webby that she won earlier this year, and how her process is different for short form videos compared to long form videos. This show is brought to you by StreamYard, a browser-based tool that lets you live stream to multiple platforms at the same time and record remote podcasts in studio quality. It's built for creators to make your job way easier. We use it to record this show. Woohoo! Welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Wow, this is exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're our second right. guest. So you are part of the inaugurating class of this wow. podcast. Wow. Inaugural, that's the word I want to use. Honored um, to be number two. Always love being second, you know. It's like, number two is a great improve. number. Great number. Great number. Yeah. Underrated, in fact. We're going to start off with some rapid fire questions and try your best to keep it to one sentence. So the first one is, what's your current setup for this call? FX3, 16 to 35, GM, 2.8, and a Rode USB mic. Where did you grow up? Rochester, New York. Favorite YouTuber? Divisive question. <laughs> That's really hard. Um, Favorite YouTuber first... this year? <laughs> Even harder. Um, <laughs> Even worse. Yeah. Uh, oh, I really like grainy days. It's all about film. Photography. Nice. Biggest inspiration who's not a YouTuber? I didn't prep for this well. You didn't you didn't know. We're we're rapid firing these at you. It's corny, but honestly, my mom, she's she she works so hard and she like work hard, play hard. Mom, my OG. Love that. What future technology are you most excited for? Smaller phones. Hmm. Most memorable moment from your education at School of Visual Arts. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to expose too much, but <laughs> <laughs> all of the friends I made along the way. Um, and I'll ask, what's your favorite coffee order and your milk of choice? If I'm going to a coffee shop, I usually just get like an iced coffee with cream. Plain and simple. Hard to mess up. If I'm at home, though, I have like a very long morning routine that involves like a very fancy grinder and measuring the beans, the, the right amount of water, and I do pour over. With My partner does cream. the same. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to have a ritual. Good to have a yeah. routine. Yeah. I get made fun of for right. it. But yeah. I make fun of him too, but it's good. It's a good thing. I'm really secretly envious that you guys can do it. Meanwhile, I'm like putting stuff over a tea bag and hoping it's good in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yes. I, I could take it. You can make fun of me. It's okay. No, it's fine. It's we we get to the point where we make fun of coffee snobs when it's like above the top, when it's really like you're measuring to the milliliter and it's really intense and obnoxious. That's what we always talk about. That's so me. That's what it's, oh, I think you're worse than I mean, I think you're better than what I'm talking about. 
Not worse. I think you meant the first thing you said. No, I am no, worse. no, no. And that's okay. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's something you can be passionate about. It's a good thing. No, no, no. It's There's people out there. Anyway, we don't have to harp on this. But I wanted to ask, because I also went to college in New York City, what was it like for you to attend college in New York City? And I know for me, it was sort of like, I wanted to be in New York. I didn't really want a campus. Did you feel the same way? And um, do you think that impacted your education? Yeah. So I, I'm one of those people where when like my mind's made up about something, I just do it. And I don't really think about how that's going to play out, which is both incredible and not at times. Um, and so at 18, I just decided I wanted to go to SVA School of Visual Arts for film. And I didn't even think about what living in New York City might be like. I just moved there. Um, I grew up in a suburb of Rochester. Uh, I joke that we have like no culture because we really don't have much. Um, And so I just moved to this giant city with loads of culture. And in a big way, New York City raised me. Um, I quickly learned how to take the subway, how to make a really quick order at the bodega, um, how to approach strangers when you're lost. Um, And so, yeah, going to New York City for college was um, definitely life changing and, and made me who I am. Um, it was a great decision while I was there though, I had, I wished that I had like the big college campus and the big college parties because you definitely don't have those in New York city. And I remember thinking, wow, I just wish I had like a big field to go play Frisbee in. And then I'd go to central park and it was like close to that. But, um, but looking back on it, I'm very happy with the choice I made. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like everybody's different. There's people who are very adamant about the sort of college. Um, Purist. The whole, yeah. The very sort of like Ivy league or American tradition of like going to college, having a campus. And then there are people who are like, I just want to be in the city as soon as possible. So that's cool that you didn't yeah. really think about it. You just kind of went for it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I didn't, I didn't think about it at all. Um, and, and most of the times I'm not thinking about, I mean, now that I'm getting older, I'm, I'm 29 now and, I think decisions I make now have much like longer repercussions. Like even if I go out and I party really hard, like I'm going to feel sick for a lot longer than I used to. Um, And so now I'm, I'm trying to think a little bit more. Um, But, but yeah, when I moved to New York, I didn't have a thought in the world about where I was putting myself. So yeah, just, just close your eyes and move somewhere. You know, that's, (laughs) that's my advice. I hope that's what you pull away from this podcast today. (laughs) Just be brave. And just close your eyes and go. I love that. Um, What was your initial dream when going to film school? Like, did you have sort of the Tarantino thought of like, I want to be like this filmmaker or have like a role model that you wanted to um, model yourself after where you just sort of like, I like film and I want to study it. Yeah. Again, it was a full send um, with, with no idea of what I wanted. I just, um, I was super dyslexic. I still am super dyslexic. Reading was really hard. Um, and I had ADD and all I knew was like images and like making videos. And that's like how I survived high school. Um, so I went to film school cause I was like, well, this is what I like to do. I like to make things with cameras. Um, soon when I got there, I realized I wanted to go more the cinematography route. So then my dream kind of became being a cinematographer of sorts. Um, but I started working on sets my freshman year. I worked for like X Factor and America's Got Talent, like doing PA work. And I was working, I think, 17, 18 hour days a lot of the time, which I was making great money for a freshman in college. Um, but uh, I quickly realized I had no life outside of that. And I knew I didn't want to work on sets the rest of my life by the time I graduated, which is what led me into media. Cool. Okay. Okay. That's, That's a good awesome. place to transition. Yeah. Could you tell us about the story of like how you started working at Vox as their one and only equipment technician during your senior year of college? Mo read my website. I did. <laughs> <laughs> we both did research, but Mo, Mo, you can tell. Mo's a very storied and read person. The emails, if you can tell from the emails. Damn, I should I should have uh, beefed it up for you a little bit, but I'll do that for you now. Um yeah, so my senior year of college, while, while I was at SVI, I was working in their equipment room, servicing all of their gear, um, which is a very common job of folks who want to be DPs or work on set. It's like, oh, I'll just go work in an equipment room somewhere or a rental house. Um, and I met someone named Kenya Scott, 
Um, and she uh, left and went to Vox working in their equipment room. So my senior year, she hit me up. And she's like, we're looking for someone part time to come help me fill orders here because Vox is growing rapidly. And I said, hell yeah. Um, so my senior year, I was working part time at Vox Media, um, which felt so cool because as I, I was like 21 at the time and I was walking into these giant New York City office buildings and I was like, I got a job. And I just felt like I was totally the shit, which is so beautiful. Good job, Becca, you know, to look back on. Um, and so, yeah, I was servicing all of their gear. And once I graduated college, I went full time for Vox Media. Um, and she was right. It was growing rapidly. And I knew I wanted to use the gear, not service the gear. Like I would send out these awesome orders and I'd be like, oh, where are you guys going? And the video teams would be like, uh, we're going to Europe. We're going to California. And all I wanted to do was like travel with a camera in my hands. Um, so I just started networking hard. Like I took coffee and lunch with anyone I could, which is why I still do that to this day. Hit me up. Let's let's go out to coffee. Um, and I met a guy at the verge. Um, and he's like, I think we're, I think we're hiring. You should apply. And I was like, yep. And I was like, put in the good word for me. And he was like, yep. And I had an interview with the verge, which was such a bad interview. Like, I mean, they were like, do you know Adobe after effects? Like, I was like, yeah, of course. Like, they're like, how are you with premiere? I was like, I'm great. I hadn't opened those programs <laughs> since like high school. I, I didn't like, when you open Premiere, um, like there used to be this like, you know, box that came up that had like all these settings you could dial in. And like now as an editor, I just hit okay. Like I, I can dial in those settings later. I remember my first day at The Verge, that box came up and like my boss was standing over my shoulder and I was like, So what do you what do you guys what do you guys put in here? You know, like I got what I put in here, but what do you do? And he was like, you just hit okay. I was like, yeah, that's what I do too, man. Um, so anyway, they took a big risk on me. Um, I think because they saw that I knew cameras really well. I knew gear really well. Um, and they taught me everything I now know about making like internet content. I, I, in like the six and a half years I've been there, I've learned everything I know, which has been incredible. It's a great place for, for that. So that's a little bit about that's me. Awesome. And that's like so cool. during those initial days, did it f still feel like a, like a, I don't know, like a startup Vox was like fairly new back then. And like, what did it feel like? What was the energy in the offices like? Yeah. It, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to have been there from when I was, I was in 2016. Um, when I first started, we were in this like office in Midtown that was like, like Vox was growing so rapidly. They just took like any floor they could get in the office. So we were on like all these weird floors, nothing was connected. Um, and it was just growing and growing and growing. And there was like happy hours on Thursdays and the energy was excited. Um, you know, internet media was like, especially video was just like becoming really hot. A lot of advertisers were in on it. Um, and yeah, the mood was like up, really up. Um, I have seen it uh, ebb and flow a lot since then. Um, I've seen us grow to like this really beautiful, huge office. Now I've seen us get rid of offices. Um, but yeah, it was, it was exciting. And, you know, I think now a lot of people say like, we're still throwing like darts at the board of like what kind of content to make and what will stick. Um, but like back then you were like really throwing darts and you could throw any dart you wanted. Um, so it was, it was fun. It was also scary, um, but it was a great time to learn as well, learn what works and what doesn't. So yeah, grateful for all of it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, because video and media was kind of taking a new turn when you started there, did you get to kind of create your own position? How did it work with you navigating through the company when it feels like there's no sort of defined path ahead? Yeah, well, they started me as like a junior director, which basically meant make make the best video you you can with our editorial team um and so that that was a lot of like directing people and you know trying to make something that wasn't just someone talking to camera i mean that's still what it is um so that was kind of my role it was like just don't mess up you know like just, just make good video that's correct um in a lot of ways that's still what i do now um but it's kind of I quickly realized that I had a lot more control over the videos if I just was in them. 
Um, and so like me being on camera kind of sprouted from necessity. Like I just, I needed to make videos faster and I wanted to make them more engaging. So I was like, I'll just do it. And so I started hosting videos. Um, and you quickly learn that the internet is ruthless. Um, and (laughs) it's going to be brutal and you're going to get some painful comments and that's okay. Uh, you gotta, you gotta learn to keep going or just don't read them, which is what I, you know, kind of do now. Um, but, uh, but yeah, then once I started hosting videos, um, there was more on the line with each video, which made me like care about them more, um, and put more effort in. And I would say only within the last year, am I like finally feeling like I'm doing something different with my scripts. I'm actually bringing my voice to it. I actually have enough knowledge to like, you know, really take a stand on something. So ever growing, ever changing, ever That's trying so cool. to do new stuff. Yeah. Did that answer that? I don't really yeah. know. How yeah. I was going to say too, because I also watched your separate channel, the one you do on your own. I just really love your energy. Your on camera energy is really natural and really fun. Um, and you talked about it a little bit. You were like, okay, I have to put myself in these videos and I wanted to sort of up the energy and the excitement of what you were doing. Um, where did you learn to do that? Was it sort of researching other creators and copying what you thought worked or was it something that came natural to you? just being on camera. Well, thank you for the compliment. I appreciate it. Of course. Um, A lot of times, you know, like creators, like we put work out and we never see anyone watching the work that we do. And so it often feels, you know, like you you don't really know how the audience is reacting to things other than like view count. And that's not an incredibly valid way to, uh, to understand if, if people are connecting, but um, so the question was, how did I learn to be on camera? Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I, like I was saying, I am super dyslexic and had like terrible ADD growing up. Um, and so making videos has kind of always been my way to like express myself, um, to learn, uh, to entertain myself as well. Um, and so I used to always make skits with my friends on mini DV tapes. Um, and all through high school, I like carried a camera around that I still have right here, um, with me. Um, so I've just like been on camera like that I've been filming for most of my life. Um, And so it's not, I don't feel the same fear that I think a lot of people feel when like a lens is in front of them. Um, So I've just never like thought about it. That's a horrible answer, but I just, I really, it's, it just comes really naturally to me. Um, I was also on my like school's morning show. (laughs) We like were a lucky school that had like a filmed morning show so I did that for many years and that was like broadcast through the school. Um, so it's kind of just something I've always done. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow, I didn't even know that was a real thing. Like I thought, like I've watched the Spider-Man movies and they have a film morning show. Oh my and God. Like, that's, that, there's no way that's real. Right. But it's, you're telling me it's like some schools actually do that. Yeah. I mean, if, if y'all want to do the research and try to find these tapes, I would appreciate it. Cause I've tried. Um, but yeah, we, we would every morning, like, we'd have a teleprompter. We had a studio. There was three of us and we would like, you know, here's what's for lunch. Here's who won the basketball game last night. Um, yeah, it was, it was awesome. And then like the TV production class would make like intros for the morning show. That was like, Oh, that's so fun. One of the assignments. And so like, they were just like weird little 10 second videos. And then it would say like Webster Thomas morning show at the end. Um, yeah, very lucky. I, I went to a very, very cool, um, public school that, luckily had, you know, pretty good funding and we got to do all that sort of stuff. That's really fun. And it was not a stupid answer at all. I think the, I don't know, because I went to school as an actor and many film kids I know, they would be like, I would never go in front of the camera. Um, So there is sometimes that, I think that false narrative that a lot of film kids just really want to be behind and really sort of direct the narrative that way. So it's cool that you I've always felt comfortable doing both sides and it's kind of a part of who you are and how you express yourself. So I love that answer. Yeah. That was a great answer. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think I'm, I'm very lucky to have found like a, a path. Um, I just, it just feels right. And I'm lucky that I get to do it. So yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I saw in one of your videos, 
it was your first video on your sort of vlog channel. And you were like, I started vlogging because I want to capture the cool life I've been blessed to have. And I wanted to ask too, why did you start vlogging? Because I think as creatives, when you're working at a company, you can sort of check all the boxes for the thing you have to do at the company, but you still are like, okay, but what do I want to make? And what is my creative outlet? Did you feel like it was something that you could put your extra energy from work or just like other ideas you had that maybe you couldn't accomplish at work? That was sort of your outlet for it. Is that what it became? Maybe. Yeah. Usually the question I get asked is, why did you stop vlogging? So I'm happy to talk to you about uh, why I started and I can talk to you about (laughs) how it's been going. Um, Yeah. I, you know, like you're saying, having a creative outlet is really important. Um, At the time, you know, filming tech is limiting. I mean, I'm trying to tell myself that it's not, and I'm trying to do some new things within the space, but Um, I did just want to start documenting the life around me um, and like all of the cool things I'd learned in Brooklyn and like all of my friends. Um, It was also like that point in the pandemic where like we were like free, but we weren't like super free. So I wanted something to do. Um, And yeah, so I I just, I just started. Um, It's, there's like more to that answer, but that's it. That we'll keep it at that. Um, yeah. You know, I think it's tough being a creator on other people's platforms, and I wanted to have a place that could be my own. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the core of it. Um, my Mac is also about to die, which I didn't think about. So <laughs> that's okay. No, I can fill the space. No, it's it's interesting. Yeah. yeah talk. 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 Um, no, because I was going to ask. I don't know where my charger is. Oh gosh, it's the race. It's the race to find the charger. No, I was going to ask too, because I think sometimes when you're in a creative role, but it's kind of adjacent to maybe, I don't know, the passions that you have and that you're pursuing outside of work, it's sort of like, okay, at the end of the day, do you feel like, oh, I'm so ready to create that thing? Or you're like, I'm exhausted from doing something adjacent to my thing and maybe tomorrow. It's some, I don't know. I feel that as a creator as well. That some days yeah. I'm like, oh, wow, I'm really motivated. And other days I'm like, okay, well, I've been on camera or I've been editing something and it's not mine, but it's close enough that I'm a little bit exhausted for today. Yeah, it's it's hard. Um, I After I started vlogging, like even like, I don't know, two vlogs in, like I just felt kind of chained to Adobe. <laughs> Um, like the filming is fun for me. I love filming. I can film all day, every day. I've been filming my entire life. Like, um, I love making vlogs about my past because I've literally been filming my life, my entire life. Um, so it's so easy. The footage is there, but I did get tired of like sitting at a desk and editing, which is kind of why I've slowed down. It's just like hard to face the page is what I say. Um, all, all day and then all night. Like there's another, there's like another part to the the vlogging thing as well. Like my memory is photo and video and I wanted, and I still want to document the things I'm doing now so that in 10 years I can look back at them. Like if you see me scrolling on my phone 90% of the time, I'm just going through old photos and videos and just like reminiscing. Um, And so creating like a visual space that's documenting my life was really important to me. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. I think, I think the, the biggest thing that I tell myself and I, and I want to tell other people too, is like, if you're going to create for you, um, like just, just keep, keep that in mind that it's for you. You know, I think as creators, we get so caught up in this idea of like chasing numbers and chasing money and, you know, getting the sponsorships or whatever, but like nothing's going to be, it's, it's only going to be better if you, if you do it for yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's what I try to tell myself. Or All even topic, chasing oh, output. Uh, oh, sorry, Mo. Go ahead. No, no, no. No, no, no. You, you were going to follow up directly, so I want to let you finish. No, I was just... I, I think what you were saying with 
you kind of are facing the page again, it's sort of like you're chasing output at a certain point. Like maybe it's, oh, I really like the filming part of this and this is really exciting and I'm capturing things. But the second you have to edit it together and sort of make it decipherable for someone else, then it starts to feel like work. Maybe I feel like that's true for creators. Like maybe you love, I don't know, um, filming stuff around you. But then the second you have to be in the editing, editing studio and like create it into a video, maybe that's when it becomes like work too. Maybe for you in that sense, it was like, oh, to actually take what I filmed and put it in a vlog, then it becomes less fun when it, the original idea was capturing it. I don't know. It's just interesting to think about it that way. Yeah. The, the, the problem I face is that like I can capture all the video in the world, but like I won't go back and just watch my like raw video that I took from my like A7C. So if I put it into like, if I edit into a vlog, then I'll actually like watch it back. Oh, true. Um, true. But, but yeah, I think, I think, you know, the word creator is so like broad these days and, you know, I mean, there are people, this is like their full-time job. I would consider myself one of those people. And then there's like, I would consider, like I have a lot of friends who like go on trips and they like make little edits of their trips and they put it up for just their friends to see They're creators too. Yeah. You know? And so 100%. it's that tough thing of like, you know, we use this word creator as like this all encompassing thing, but there's like big differences between like being a creator for yourself and then like it being your full-time job. Yeah. You lose sight of what may be really fun about that for you. In some cases, some people are lucky and don't, but yeah, I uh, something I realized a few years ago is that my passion has always been photo and video, and now it is my job, and therefore it is not quite my passion anymore. Um, which is why I shoot mm. so much film, like because like using a film camera to me feels still like pure and fun and different mm-hmm. enough that it doesn't feel like a job. Yeah, um, but yeah, yeah, that's a, a word of a word of caution if you're going to uh, pursue your. Um, your, your lifelong hobby as your job, uh, it quickly becomes not as fun. Yeah. Um, but there's still plenty of fun to be had, but no, that's, that's a good, that's a good word of warning for sure for creators. Cause it seems like the most fun thing in the world. And then you're doing it and you're like, okay, I don't want to actually tire myself of this because now I'm assigning a value to it. It could be so hard. Absolutely. I don't regret anything. Um, I love my job. Um, but you know, there comes a time when like I'll be in the most beautiful locations filming an incredible video, um, you know, about a new camera and I'll have this moment of like dread to take photos and it it hurts, honestly, because like, you know, you've been blessed with all of these incredible things (coughs) and then it's okay. Um, And then like, you're not, you're not enjoying it. So, you know, everything uh, you gotta, you gotta kind of, balance things out i hated that i coughed right during that <laughs> that's okay <laughs> Cough away. it's a, a natural process baby yeah to our video editor grant please keep all those in oh god yeah actually in make them louder i want them to like peak <laughs> you just keep <laughs> zooming in becca's trying to have a really like and it is a super profound moment but you just cut to me just hacking away <laughs> oh god all and right that was um, also a profound moment for your internals lungs yeah yes <laughs> anyway i was gonna well, ask you about like I, I like what you said about documenting your life and like being able to look back at it and stuff because i used to journal like maybe 10 years ago on a regular basis just to like write down things that were happening and as a guy it did not feel natural for me to like take pictures and stuff and i, I can revisit those journals and like have a a good time reminiscing but more recently, I've started taking pictures and like inserting them into my journals. And that has made just like cool. a huge difference. I love seeing the visuals and I wish that we could capture smells too. But you let me know. You're the tech expert. Do we have anything like this that we can like capture smells? Yeah. I mean, smell vision is like really coming down the pipes. Um, I've been in contact <laughs> with a lot of folks about this and we are I'm super excited to be reviewing these these products soon. Yeah. <laughs> can you imagine <laughs> i wish i wish I, I also yeah i i am very attached to like uh smells as well i mean like you know there's like my grandma's house right like i know what that smells like and when i smell it out in the world i'm like <laughs> um yeah where's it coming from grandma are you here <laughs> um, seriously so so i feel that but i increasingly i mean this is a, a bit sidestepping 
um, increasingly, and, and especially since like being on the internet, I'm also learning the importance of like capturing things just for me. Um, and so like something like a smell is so sacred and wonderful because like you can't emulate it with technology and you can't really give it to anyone else. Like it's so internal. Um, and more and more I find myself like drawn to, to those sort of natural, um, feelings and, uh, senses. I wanted to ask, where did the term bud come from? (laughs) Yeah, cool. Uh, I go back and forth on this because, um, like it has become like this term, like I call, I do, I call my actual friends, my buds. I call yeah. like, you know, my, my fans, my buds, um, my friends now call me their bud, which I always like when I hear someone call me that I'm like, oh, gotcha. Um, <laughs> but it started because I was reviewing earbuds. Um, and oh. I was saying like, I was saying ear, but like bud, 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 bud all the time. And then I started using it in my real life. I mean, not that this isn't my real life, but like my personal life is a better word. Um, so I called, started calling my friends, my buds. And then I just like worked it into a video once. And I think like one commenter mentioned it and I was like, I guess I'll just use that. And so then I just started using it and I never know. It's like, kind of like, I don't, I like, like the word bud, it kind of feels like you're like talking down to someone and I want people to know. I never mean that. Um, I see it like eye to eye. Um, so yeah, so some days I'm like, uh, should I like not use that anymore? Should I change it? But it seems that folks like it and I don't know. I like it. And I don't know. I like it too. Yeah. I think, I think in the way you use it, it's not patronizing. I think it's very sort of okay. like, like you said, eye to eye sort of like, oh, I remember you said it. You were like, oh, these earbuds are like a really bright blue color, but my bud so-and-so would love this. And it just feels sort of like everybody's on the same plane. I just wondered where it came wow, from. Wow, good pull. I know exactly the friend you're talking about. Dang. I remembered from that video. And that was the first time I heard it. And then I kept hearing it in different videos. And I was like, oh, I'm catching on to something. Um, yeah. No, I just wanted to see where the inception was, if it was like a silly yeah. story. But that's cool that it came from that's your it. actual work. I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah, it came from my work, bled into my personal life. And then, I don't know, now it's everywhere else. I mean, it is a really great term. It's like, uh, another thing I love about it is it's gender neutral, which is like mm-hmm. really important to me. Like, like let's stop like genderizing, like, or gendering everything. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, yeah. What up, bud? It's like so easy. It's it. so nice. I think I'll, I think okay. I'll keep it. Yeah, what's you up? should keep it. It's great. Katie, what's up with your light? Is it not there anymore? Oh my God. I think it died. Oh, oh no. my God. This is great. Oh, no. Did it die? I love the realness of this podcast. That's what I like about podcasts is when this happens in real time. Absolutely. I have a charger right near. Oh, you were were much smarter than I. No, it's just because this has happened before. So, come on. (laughs) You're talking like my laptop doesn't die on every call I'm on. (laughs) My boyfriend loves to say, he's like, you're phone is constantly at a state of like 13%. Like you charge it and then it's always always like I see it and it's less than 20%. Like how does it get there? And I'm like I I, I just navigate the world and I'm like, oh, something's dying. But this luckily enough with the lights here and the chargers here, then we're set. But everything else, all it's place. a free for all. Yes. yes. Yeah, well it'll come back eventually. Anyway. It will. It's it my will. fun little Godox like light. It's like, oh, is it yeah, the 10 inch? I don't know. It's like this guy. I don't think you oh, can see yeah. it. It's a cute little I'm bar. A, I'm taking a few of those on a shoot this week and I have never used them, but. Oh, I like them. My boyfriend <laughs> is the more techier of us. He works at our company too, but I was like, what light should I get? What thing should I get for the podcast? And he recommended this one and it's really cool. Yeah. And I like it a lot. It's just like a sweet. Feels like a little say, lightsaber. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what I'm taking. Cool. Oh, cool. Hell yeah. I didn't even notice, Mo. I I didn't even notice. That's a funny thing. Oh, my God. Becca, I just want to say you're like, you're very good at taking compliments. I mean, I noticed this like earlier in the call. Katie complimented you and you were like, I I could feel you like taking it in and like actually like being nourished by it. Because a lot of other people will either gloss over it or they'll like quickly deflect or like play it down. But like you, you seem like you can really take it. Is that something like you can can work on or what? (laughs) You got, you got to take what you can get out here. Right. You know, if someone's going to say something nice, you might as well (laughs) grab it. Um, (laughs) No, I I mean, I just, um, I, I genuinely like, 
try to be as like grateful as possible for everything. Like um, you might as well be. Um, and I think gratitude is incredibly important. And so like, I'm just, you know, I'm really, I'm really grateful that she said that to me and I appreciate it. And it's important to take a moment to like, you know, have that connection with somebody. So, so anyway, so thank you for saying that Mo. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, one of the best (laughs) parts of, uh, working at a company instead of being like a solo creator is that you can learn from like other really smart people. Right. And so I wanted to ask you about your coworkers, like who are some of your favorite coworkers and what have you learned from them? Yeah. Um, wow. Well, I've, I've been very fortunate to be surrounded by like incredible people. Um, and like the verge is something that has been around for just so long. And like, um, like we have folks that work with us who just, I mean, they, they've seen it all. Um, and it's, it's really cool to be able to send a script to somebody at the verge and, you know, they make a comment where they're like, this is going to be an example. This is not fact. Um, but, but, you know, I'll be like, oh, it's crazy. There's a keyboard on this camera. Um, I've never seen that before. And then they'll be like, in 2007, there was actually this one camera from this company you've never heard of that had five keyboards. And it's like, oh my God, thank God you're here. That's so cool. Um, so I feel very grateful to be surrounded by, um, and uh, just a wealth of knowledge. Um, but there, there is like, there's like, there's a, a, f- a few people who I don't work with anymore who, just taught me everything I know. And, um, I'm going to send him this Phil Esposito. I adore him with my whole entire heart. He's a very good friend, but he was my boss for a while. Um, and he just always pushed me to go further. Um, and it's like easy to say that someone does that, but then when there's actually someone in your life who like can speak your language and like knows how you learn, um, and can push you in those ways, it's incredible how much you can grow. And he like did that for me. Um, he pushed me to be on camera. Um, you know, he told me to slow down or speed up. Um, he was honest about like cuts, like, "Mm, this isn't your best. Um, I think the music could be changed. Um, and because he was so honest and because he like took the time, um, to get to know the way I learned, I like trust him so deeply. And my first personal YouTube videos, I like sent him cuts and he'd be like, this is great. I'm so happy you're doing this, but also you should change, you know, at 42 seconds, this small thing. And, um, and so, yeah, he's, uh, he's the best and, and definitely someone who, um, completely changed how I work and what I do. So yeah, big shout out to him. My biggest, my biggest fan, my biggest mentor and someone I trust so deeply. So I think it's important that we all have people in our lives that we can send stuff to and, and we, uh, you know, trust them to give us good notes and tell us what we need to hear. And then tell us when it's really good. Yeah. Was he there for you like day one when you started working there? Yeah, he was. Um, and and we weren't like tight right off the bat. Um, but, you know, early Verge, we used to travel a lot more. And we still do travel a lot. But we used to travel a lot. And I think I could be wrong, but like one of the shoots we became close on we went to CES and then we went to the Detroit auto show back when it was held in January in Detroit. And so like CES kills you, like you just work really, really hard for like four days straight. And then you like party, like you've never partied in your life. Um, and then we went right to the Detroit auto show and I went with him through all of this and it was like just him and I, and a lot happened to the Detroit, Detroit auto show that was like just rough, like with scripts and personnel and, like he was all I had. Um, and we just like bonded super deep over a terrible experience. Um, and ever since then we've been really good friends and, and co we were coworkers for a while, but, um, but now we're just great friends, which is, which is sometimes cooler. Okay, cool. And, uh, we're going to come back to Phil. I have another question on him and let's talk about the, the Webby that you won earlier this year. Oh my so, God. Wait, you want to see it? I have it. Oh my gosh. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> this is so exciting. Cause I like show, I show like people in my life this and they're like, what's that? But maybe, I don't know. But now we like, know. Ah! Oh, it's so cool. And, and can, can you explain best- for, for listeners what it is? Oh yeah. If you're listening to this and you can't see, I'm holding a giant spring. Um, <laughs> And it's got my name on it, which is so cool. Um, so the Webby Awards are basically the internet awards, um, best of the internet. So whether that's like, I don't know, viral content or, uh, I don't know, best in technology, 
so on and so forth. Um, and so you get, you enter and then maybe you get picked and then there's the Webby awards and there's the people choice awards and the people's choice awards is all based on voting. So I did a bunch of like call to action being like, buds, please go vote for me. Um, but the cool thing was, is that I won both the Webby which the Webby panel picks and the people's choice. So I have two of these, but the verge is making me keep one at the office. Um, but I got to bring one home and it's a giant spring. That's actually a spring. And so I I've like stepped on it a bunch of times. I actually like solid. put both of them next to each other. It's very solid. I put both of them next to each other and I like wanted to strap them to my feet and do like moon shoes. You remember <laughs> oh the moon God. shoes? I had that. But the thought. base is too heavy. The base yeah. is too heavy. It's also and the a little spring small. isn't springy enough. Yeah, yeah, it's a little, it's a little small. But I have, I have like, I mean, I wear a size eight women, so I'm, a, I don't know, oh, I have like okay, smaller feet. Anyway, yeah, I won, I won, and I got to go to the awards, and um, yeah, there was lots of like really cool other internet people there, and it was an amazing experience. And I also am uh, nominated for a regional uh, Emmy. Um, I think it's, I think it's the Emmys. Oh, yeah. that's really cool. Um, hold on, let me. I really think it is the Emmys. How does that work yeah. with online content? Are they like expanding the eligibility? Yeah the the regional Emmys is like for news, so I think oh. I, I think that's how we get to enter that. Got um, it. That's yeah, because so cool. we are a news organization. So that's in the end of October. Um, again, I don't expect to win. I didn't expect to win this either. Um, but I so know. much enjoy the process. Like, like I like really, really, really have like taught myself and and believe that you have to like enjoy the process. Like I hike a lot and, and I love the view at the top, but I'm trying to like get better about like enjoying every step on the way there. Um, and so in life I try to carry that principle as well. And I'm just so excited to go to the Emmys. Like, and I have to, I, I have to wear nice clothes, which I have some, um, but like, I'm going to like dress up and that's cool. And there's like these weird red carpets and I'm going to like go walk down that and hopefully Phil's going to go. And, um, yeah, I just am so excited to enjoy the process and like soak that in. Oh my God. And I'm like freaking out talking about, it. I can't wait. So anyway, that's so cool. So was it for the whole full frame series? Was it for the astrophotography video? What, what exactly what did you win for? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it was just for the astrophotography video, um, which I did. I have to shout out the organization I like reached out to for that. That's the um, the IDA, the International Dark Sky Association, and they are working to deem um, places all over the world as international dark sky parks, which means that um, light pollution has to be kept to a minimum. And there's lots of standards to what that means. Um, but I think it's so important what they do. So shout out to them. Um, I worked with Betty Maya Foote. She's incredible. She's an astrophotographer and she also works for IDA. Um, and yeah, we flew out to Colorado and made a video on how to photograph the stars. And I brought like a Pixel phone out there. I think it was a Pixel 7 at the time. No, it had to be a 6. Um, and I was blown away at how incredible astrophotography is on that. So, um, which reminds me, I have to pack that for my next trip, which hold on, let me just do that now because I will forget. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, That's so smart. Do it right away. Yeah. Oh, you, we have to in this house. Are you kidding me? Um, okay. That's good. Um, so, so yeah, it was just for that one. The Emmy is actually for another full frame episode, which was how to photograph wildlife you can't see. Um, and I worked with, uh, a wildlife conservation photographer, um, here in the Catskills. Um, and she specializes in, um, trap photography, like wildlife trapping, which is like setting cameras out in the woods. Um, yeah, her name is Carla Rhodes. She's a force of nature, an incredible human being who just has the biggest heart for the littlest things. And I, um, I was so honored to like spend, three days with her. We're still good friends, which is so cool. Um, and so, yeah, that's nominated for the Emmy and I, gosh, I haven't told her that we're nominated yet because like, I need to take a minute to sit down. Cause she's going to scream. Like she's actually going to scream and I love that. And, um, so <laughs> you got to capture well, that. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, just really incredible stuff. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Grateful for it all. So. Both of those videos are on the Verge's YouTube channel, right. As part of the full frame series. 
Yes, they are. Yeah, youtube.com slash The Verge. And then there's a playlist for Full Frame, and they're both in there. So check okay. them out. So for at least for the, the astrophotography video, could you take us through like how that video was made and what the collaboration process looked like? Because like in the credits on the, the web page, there was a lot of people in, uh, listed, like you were host and director, Phil Esposito was supervising producer, Alex Diaconis and Vieran Pavic. I'm butchering some of these names on camera okay. ops. Andrew and Nick on network managers, Denise Cervantes for engagement, Andrew Marino, audio mixer, Eleanor Donovan as executive producer. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I work for a large company. Um, and so there's a lot of hands in getting things made. Um, that happened to be a sponsored series, which is cool. So some of the folks on those credits just work on the sponsorship side to like bring sponsors, sponsorships through. Um, uh, Viren and Alex were on the ground doing all of the camera work for me. Um, Phil was like, you know, overseeing production, sending him scripts, you know, being like, yes, this works. No, this doesn't. Um, but for the most part, I just come up with an idea. I find people that I think will help me explain that idea. And then I go to them and I'm like, let's make something. Um, so there's not that much behind it other than just sitting here thinking of things that would be cool to do and then going and doing them. <laughs> Um, I wish I had a better answer. No, I think that's great. Um, It sounds like you, you're, you've been given a lot of like creative freedom. They trust you. Yeah. Trust is so important. I'm like, that's, that is like the word of this year for me. Um, so yeah. And, uh, what about your, your short form videos? I'm curious about the process for those. Like I loved your, your wireless earbuds microphone comparison video. I love that you use the actual audio from those buds to like make the video like that yeah. was just super useful and like compared to long form, what's your, is your process different in any way for short form? Yeah. So the way I think about short form is like, okay, this is a science experiment that I have to do in 60 seconds. Like I need to show people something cool. I need to explain why it's cool. And then I need to like get the fuck out. Um, so, so yeah, I usually come up with like an idea. So it's like, I want to show people how good the mic is on a wired earbud. That's the idea. Um, How do I visually show them that? Um, Let me do some cool like snaps and transitions. Um, And then how to like, I teach them something. Okay, let me explain Bluetooth in this. So that's kind of how I think about short form for the most part. Um, Or it's like, I found this thing that's really cool, but I can't talk about it for five minutes. So it doesn't make sense as a mid form. All right, let me make it into less than a minute. So that's, that's kind of how I think about it. And then within that, like, how can I capture people's attention? Like, how can I make this science experiment interesting? It's like, all right, is it shocking? Is it funny? Um, Is it cool to look at? Like, it kind of usually falls into one of those buckets for me. I'm still trying to figure it out. I, the beautiful thing about social video for me is that it's so quick to make. Like, I don't think a social video has ever taken me more than a day to put together from like filming to editing to scripting. Like I can usually get them done in a couple hours. Um, so, so I'm just kind of trying stuff. And that's so smart that that sort of idea of like, think of it as a science experiment. Cause we talk yeah. a lot about short form video at StreamYard because the platform launched a way to make that from longer form content. And I think so oh, cool. many people are so invested in that form right now, just because of the popularity of TikTok, And then Instagram really sort of has pushed reels out to people as media to consume. I mean, creators, I feel like I've really jumped on that. So to think of it that way is, I don't know that that's sticking with me. I think that's really smart and creators should think that way. Cause it's sort of like, okay, YouTube has found really good ways of standing out. I mean, you've got the thumbnail, you have to, there's certain there's a formula to make YouTube videos really sort of stand out to viewers. But with that, it's like, okay, how can I find the right formula again for a short form video? I just think that's really smart. Yeah. Yeah. I should make a TikTok about this, which is what I'm writing down. Oh, cool. Um, Love that. uh, Yeah. (laughs) That's the other thing that I'm learning is like when someone, like when I'm on a zoom with somebody and something's brought up and then we start having like this really good back and forth about it. I'm like, that's a TikTok. Like, yeah, there you go. Easy. 
Um, so, but yeah, I mean, it's, it is a great way to think about it. I mean, it is a visual medium inherently. Um, and science experiments are typically visual, um, and they're quick and they're amazing. I mean, who didn't love, like when you walked into a science class and they're like, today we're going to blow up a cotton ball. You're like, oh, yeah, today's the best day of my life. You know? Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. I heard, uh, Cleo Abram say something similar. Like sh- she was yeah at the ma- making videos at Vox before, and then now she's making like optimistic tech explainers on her own channel. And she's like, one that's of a, the, that's a good way of putting what she's doing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, Marquez, uh, was asking her in an interview, like, how do you think about making your videos? And she said, like, is it visually interesting? Like, I think people sometimes forget that, you know, for video, like you should actually take advantage of the medium instead of just seeing it as just another medium to like push forward in any form of information. So I'm really glad you you mentioned that. Yeah. I mean, for me, like that is my strongest hard skill is like I can film stuff like I can't do graphics almost at all. That's my dirty little secret. <laughs> um, like, it's really it's bad. hard. Oh, it's too hard. It's too hard. I'll just film it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so for me, it's like, okay, like I can, I can film something and make it look cool. Um, which is good for video, but there are folks who like are really good writers and they can make really compelling VO and like, it can be a conspiracy theory videos, you know, those like 30 minute conspiracy videos. And it's like, they show the same photo of the moon landing 20 times. And I still watch 30 minutes of it because like their script is that compelling. So yeah. there, there's always like, just think of like what you do best and, and do that really well. And you can probably make something pretty compelling. I would love to ask you about AI now. Are you ready? No, no, I'm not <laughs> ready. <laughs> can you ever be ready? Absolutely oh not. God. Ask me. <laughs> <laughs> what so, do you got? Three months ago, you you made this video where you explore like these text to video tools, deep fake tools, AI based video filters. And at the beginning, you said like, as a content creator, this terrifies me. But as a tech nerd, I'm fascinated. And at the end of it, you said you made this video because you were working on a larger piece about content creators in the AI era. So now, like three months later, where do you stand on it? And like, what else have you learned? Anything you can share about what you've been cooking up? You know, being a content creator is making promises and then just making people wait. Uh, so so you have to wait a little bit longer <laughs> for that. Um, but um, where I stand on like AI and content creation is... I, I think there needs to be a lot more regulation, which usually I'm not like the biggest fan of, but um, around like the metadata that's created with AI. Like I should be able to open up an image and like in the metadata know that like it was not created by a human. Um, that being said, there's like so many good uses of AI in content creation and we should use them. I mean, these are tools that are being created and we should be able to use them. Um, so I'm still kind of scared because, you know, like I edit very quickly and already there are tons of like AI plugins and tools that edit much faster than me. And that's like something I have that now anybody can have without me. Um, and that's scary. Um, but, um, if we learn the tools and we learn to work well with them, um, the sky's the limit and what anybody can create and more people can create. And I think everybody should be able to create stuff. So I'm here nor there, but it's good Uh, to know the tools. That's what I was trying to say in that video. Like, yeah. And some of them were really cool. And I didn't know that the deep fake stuff was like that accessible. Like one of the tools you just, just like go download it. I mean, it's web-based and you just like put somebody else's face on yours. I was like, wow, it's that easy now. Yeah. I could screenshot you right now and in 10 seconds. (laughs) I make you do other things like uh, it's just yeah. it's just that easy and everyone should know that because I feel like it's it was only a few years ago and I won't name movie titles but I've seen movies where deep fakes are done and they're just so bad that we are now at this point where they're good it's it's really scary and like I said I'm an actor so my whole industry is on strike right now I wonder how that's going to potentially impact the video creator community or the YouTube community I mean I I think you said there's so many editing tools out there that at a certain point, we may not be needed to do very basic things, but we almost hope that it doesn't go over the precipice of 
taking all of our jobs away. It's just insane to think about. But yeah, yeah. I think we're all a little bit trepidatious. Is that a word? We have trepidation. Yeah. That's a good that's ring a to it. Word. Yeah. Trepidatious. I have to actually check if that's a word. I know trepidation's a word, so we'll see. It's it's hey, we understood it to mean something, so yeah. it's a word. Yeah. Almost done here. Um, what advice would you give to creators who want to become more like journalistically rigorous when they make explainer or investigation style videos? That's a really, really good question. Um, I'm very lucky that I have like a plethora of fact checkers that read through my work and have, like I was saying, a vast knowledge of the space. Um, if you're doing it on your own, like do your research, double check everything. Like, is it, is it really 24 megapixels? Like find it at least on like three websites that says, yes, it is. Um, that's, that's my, my biggest piece of advice. Also, like if you could be wrong about something, you're probably wrong about it. (laughs) Mm. So just keep checking. Like, I mean, I've, I've made so many mistakes in videos and there's nothing worse than like a video going live and a commenter being like, actually, that's not the price or actually it's not the first camera that's that small and is also a full frame. Um, and there's nothing more embarrassing than that. Just know that like you're only hurting yourself and your own ego. Uh, so yeah, double check everything. Yeah. Line by line. Yeah. Worth it to do the extra hours of research. Um, so worth it. (laughs) Yeah. It sucks. Then you don't have to edit it and then refilm things and be like, actually guys, this is what it is actually the stat. Yeah. No, for sure. Yeah. So a tradition we're trying to cultivate at the podcast is um, sort of passing the baton. So can you shine the spotlight on another creator? Who else should our audience watch? Who is your favorite creator out there right now? Or someone on the rise for you? That's awesome. Um, I already spoke about Grainy Days. He's Mm -hmm. awesome. Just like really, really good scripts, um, which is something I'm so jealous of because I'm just not a writer. Um, I would say, I mean, they're already big, but like under the desk news on TikTok is super cool. Um, like they've just, I mean, I got to speak with them down in DC when I was down there filming about like TikTok bands and, you know, they were, they were like, I started this because I felt like news was a little gatekeeping and, you know, people didn't feel like they were smart enough to understand the news, but they are. And I just think that's a really cool thing to find what you create on. Um, Like accessibility is so important. So I, I I mean, they're already super big, but like they're super cool. Um, But I would say what I do when I open the YouTube app is like, you know, you get fed all sorts of stuff. I look at view count and I usually watch the video with the least amount of views, like almost Mm. always. Like if it has 800 views, mm, I love it. Like that's right where I want to be. Um, because I think the best ideas like always come from folks who have like the least amount of resources. Um, and so I want to, I want to watch what they're doing. Um, like that's, that's the pulse I stay on. So I can't, I can't name any names. Cause like I would just open up YouTube and like click whatever it is. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where it's at for me. That's a sweet spot. I love that. I think too, it kind of goes back to the point you said about if you're, um, writing something, and there is really sort of hard facts involved, like repeatedly editing and checking. And for people who maybe don't have the resources of like a huge fan base, like putting out content, maybe immediately they're getting eyes. It's almost like there's a pressure in a way to build the audience. You have to be more careful. You have to be more deliberate. That's really cool. Yeah. I love that. That's that's a really good thing to hear, I think, for yeah, small creators. I, I, also, I just like value like like people being real. And like so much of like big creators, like, yeah, maybe what they're making is real. And yeah, maybe they are giving out a million dollars or whatever, but like everything they're doing is being done with a big team and it's super fabricated and it's calculated. And I like, I want to watch like, I don't know, Jessica who like has her iPhone and I don't know, is like exploring some mall I'll never see. Like, that's what I want to see. I think that's where the real stuff is. So. It's cool. Yeah. It's really, it's cool and special. And maybe it's a unique perspective that big creators wouldn't have for whatever reason, just like from yeah. where they are. Um, yeah. 
Right. And none of that is to say that I don't also watch like all of my competitors and what oh, they're of doing. Course. <laughs> like I definitely do. Um, but yeah, when I'm just trying to enjoy myself or like uh, any sort of outdoor documentary, like, I don't know, slacklining, climbing, mountain biking. Like I watch those documentaries endlessly. So inspiring. So cool. And I love nature. So that's so cool. I love that. Um, we also want to ask what's a piece of content you're currently obsessed with and why? Yeah. Oh, I got one. I don't know if I want to share though. Cause it's like such an inspiration for my next video. I'll share. Ooh. <laughs> well, by the time we release <laughs> this, it'll probably line up where you've released your video. So don't worry. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so right now, oh, you know, a couple of things. Cut all this out. Let me let me pull up my sources real quick. Black Diamond has this video called Dawn Patrol, Why We Rise. And maybe you can link it. But it does yeah. a beautiful job. I'm right now, like my biggest, the thing I think about every morning when I hike, when I'm driving, like endlessly I'm obsessed with right now is how can I make photos more fun to look at? Like I make videos with tons of photos in them and it is so boring to like just put a slideshow through and I'm done with the Ken Burns effect. Like how can I make photos more fun? Um, and that video, Dawn Patrol, Why We Rise by whatever. Um, it has like some really great use of archival photos and they mm -hmm. animate them and they have like, you know, what looks like paper cuts on them and it's beautiful. And I think you're going to see a lot of that in my next video, which should come out by the time this is out. Um, and then awesome. also Apple music is doing, they're putting out really great content on YouTube. Um, and specifically Zane Lowe, um, who was at one time. Okay. He, we all know who Zane Lowe is. Yeah. I love his, okay, cool. I love his interviews. Oh my God. His interview style is just like really beautiful. And I'm trying to be a better interviewer. Um, and so I've been studying him heavily, um, how he asks questions, how he flows, like, you know, was that research or did he just like know that? Like, uh, um, so, so a lot of like what he's doing is great. And what's better is that the, the ones that aren't shot in the studio are shot in like really intimate spaces and the way they sit is really beautiful. They're shot really beautifully. Um, and so I've been studying those heavily. So that's, that's where I'm at creatively. I kind of like get obsessed with things and then I just watch a lot of them and, and try to figure out how I can do my spin on that. I don't want to copy it, but like, how can yeah. I put that into my practice? That's awesome. I just want to mention too, yeah. I don't know if we'll put this in. I also have ADHD. So like the fixation thing and then being like, okay, that's the thing. And then figuring out your own spin. I love that. And I get it. I totally get it. Yeah. I, I am, I have like an obsessive, like personality. Like if it's a song, if it's a movie, it doesn't matter. Like if I like it, it's going to be on repeat um, yeah. for, for a long time. And then I'm going to figure out why it's speaking to me and, you know, go down the little therapy rabbit hole but anyway so that's <laughs> no but I'm it's at. good as a creator I think if you sort of are able to zoom in and really pick up the fine details and then incorporate it into your own practice it's a level of detail and dedication to what you're doing that I don't think everybody has so if you're really doing that regularly I mean that's just that's a really great skill to have I think that's really valuable and again, yeah. you're not copying someone. You're like taking a spin on it, but you're inspired by them, which I think is a yeah. huge compliment. Yeah, I think if you, like I put out a video about like the Polaroid i2, it's like a, you know, Polaroid's newest camera. Um, and in that, I was, I was trying to scan all those photos, but I don't have a photo scanner. And I was absolutely not going to take a photo of every single one of these photos. Um, so I went to like my local library and I live in a very cute upstate town with a very cute little library with a lovely librarian. And I was like, hi, can I use your scanner for like five hours? And I started scanning and like the, they were so low res and I tried messing with every setting. And then the librarian was over and like, bless her heart. She was like, we can do this. And I was like, no, we can't. <laughs> and so then I ended up just like filming them on a coffee table and I loved it, but it was like that lack of like resource that like led me to that. Um, and, and so, so yeah, I, I guess the, the moral of the story is there, like, you know, you have everything you need right in front of you. You just got to figure out how to use it. So that's funny. My next question was any final words you want to leave the audience with? 
um, just make stuff for you, you know, like, I think there, there's so much like clout chasing and there's like so much like, I need to get the biggest, baddest camera, like, just like go have a good time. Life is like way too short. <laughs> and, true. um, I think, I think just be grateful and, and have fun. Um, yeah. And, and hit me up for coffee. <laughs> Maybe. I'm going to do that. Maybe I'll answer. I mean, yeah, yeah, let's get coffee. Yeah, sure. let's do it. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Um, and um, then where can people find you on the internet? Oh my God, everywhere. Um, but, <laughs> and, and it changes where like I like to be. Um, I, I'm sorry. Uh, so if you follow me somewhere, I'll see you there in a couple of months and then I'll see you somewhere else, somewhere else. Um, or some, anyway. <laughs> um, but Instagram, uh, Becca.Farsachi. Uh, I'm on Twitter, Becca.Farsachi. Um... I don't know, LinkedIn, uh, youtube.com slash Becca Versace. Uh, if you search my name, you'll find me. Um, and, uh, and yeah. And if you're like, uh, I, I always tell people they're like, Oh, you're Becca from the verge. And I'm like, yeah, but who are you? Um, so like, if you want to message me on Instagram or whatever, like send me what you're doing. Like, I want to see what you're doing. You see what I'm doing. I want to see what you're doing. I want to know who you are and where you're from. Um, you know, this, this ain't about me. So, so yeah, I love that. This episode was recorded with StreamYard. If you want to record a podcast like this, check out the link in the description to get started. Thanks for joining us today on Inside the Creator Studio. See you next time.